Good morning. I think first and foremost, you know, I personally can't tell you how amazing it is to see our combined customer base come together under one roof. Um, I mean, our entire team has been waiting for this for a long time, and I think in many ways, today in this experience really does mark and solidify our merger. I mean, this is, I can't say it enough, this is what it's all about. Also want to just um, correct one thing. Nick likes to talk about our first meeting with the VC at the Starbucks, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't even a real Starbucks. It was a Starbucks kiosk off the Garden State Parkway. So to see 300 people in a room like this is just, for me, unbelie an unbelievable experience. So thank you again for, for being here. Um, so as Brandon mentioned, we're really excited about this panel because really it is the first of its kind. It's the first time that leadership from the five big firms have got together to talk about real estate, I'm sorry, to talk about technology and its impact on the future of brokerage. Uh, to put things into perspective, the companies up here are currently managing over 2.5 billion square feet on VTS. So they have been and will continue to be a major driver in the way that our, our industry consumes and ultimately leverages technology. Um, so today we hope you come away with a much better understanding of where the brokerage business is heading, how technology is going to actually play a part in that journey, and how our panelists are preparing their, their companies for digital transformation because certainly things are moving at a, at a much faster pace than we've ever seen before. Uh, from a format uh, uh, perspective, we're going to keep the discussion to about 40 minutes and then hop into about 20 minutes of questions because we do want this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, so gentlemen, we have over, I think, 300 of your, of your customers in this room that are eager to hear from you, so let's just hop in with some quick introductions, sure. maybe starting with, uh, with Barry. Barry Gossin, CEO of Newmark. Nice to be here. Uh, what, uh, you, uh, as, as in, in their mind, I always wonder when, uh, when someone from the technology industry comes in, into my office, I, I wonder what they're viewing. They're probably viewing the future dead. You know, like uh, those cartoons where you, you see Wile E. Coyote looking at some chicken and <coughs> thinking of him as roasted. Uh, and uh, I, the, I guess the idea to be here is to figure out how not to be roasted. Well said, Barry. I'm Dylan Taylor. <laughs> I am president and COO of Colliers. I've been with Colliers nine years. I've got global responsibility for the operation, and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really happy uh, you guys are putting this together. Well done. And I really enjoyed your remarks, Brandon. Super. Uh, Joe Scutinius with Cushman Wakefield. Uh, super excited to be here. We are very, very focused on technology, um, kind of as a foundation of what we're trying to do. Uh, and the interface, and so uh, it's going to be uh, fun to be a part of this discussion. And I'm Mike Lafitte with CBRE. I serve as uh, Global Group President, so I'm responsible for all of our lines of business around the world, um, kind of our products and our client care program. Uh, we're spending, as everyone up here, a lot of time uh, around technology and partnering with great firms like DTS and doing some of the things uh, pretty exciting ourselves, so glad to be here. I'm Greg O'Brien. I'm the CEO of the Americas for JLL, and I'm on our global executive board. Um, I would have thought my electrical engineering degree would help me with this big technology uh, wave. It's not helping at all. <laughs> um, I was not a software engineer. My son just graduated Tuesday, computer science degree in engineering, spending a lot of time talking to him about what we need to do. And uh, by the way, for all you technology folks, he's, uh, he's looking for a job. <laughs> Brokers. Oh, man. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I was one, so I can say that. Uh, all right, guys. Well, listen, obviously a lot's changing in the industry, and I think the, the thing that everyone here would love to hear a little bit more about it are really the brokerage firms. How are you guys thinking about technology, I think most specifically uh, over the next couple of years, and, and the way it will impact the way that you provide your service to your customers, and um, if there are some specific examples of initiatives that you guys are excited about at your, at your firms, we'd love to hear about those as well. So. Want to kick us off? Well, uh, five years ago, we sold our business to a sister company of Cantor Fitzgerald. For those of you who don't, don't know much about Cantor Fitzgerald, they, were the, they created the first electronic trading platform, which used to be manual trading and now is uh, pretty much automatic. Uh, they built a company called eSpeed, which they sold to NASDAQ for a uh, billion three. Um, and uh, we own 10% of the NASDAQ as a result of that. So uh, understanding the transition and the transformation from one business to another is, uh, is part of the DNA. Uh, they also built the first uh, zipper for Wall Street trading called Tellerate many years ago and sold it to Dow Jones 
for $2 billion. So uh, there's probably over 900 patents. We have 20 IP attorneys. We have, uh, internally, we're building our own CRM. So we've watched the rollouts of CRMs fail. And what you do is uh, you buy a CRM. It's one size fits all, and you have to customize it for uh, the, the audience that you have internally. And so you might as well do it yourself, and you don't have necessarily the user fees. So uh, I was struck by the photo. We have the photo of Steve Jobs in our office. We have a digital uh, photo of Steve Jobs in our office. And, I, and when, for those of you, that anybody know the, the motto of, of, uh, of Apple years back? It was think different. And you, and you wonder why, you know, the natural English is think differently. But the fact that he said think different was he wanted to be different. And the, the nuance of thinking different means, meant a lot to me. So each and every day that I come to the office and think about what's our approach to the business, it's about value creation, it's about information, it's about uh, giving people the tools uh, necessary to do their business better internally and giving the information to our clients to understand their business better. And uh, that, when you look at Peter Drucker, what the other photo on there, and talk about if it could be measured, it could be improved. Well, when we got into the consulting business, what we realized that most of our clients don't really have information. And this goes back 10 years ago. And that the ability to give them a dashboard or to give them uh, a way to look at their information and parse through it and use it in bite-sized pieces that will help them navigate their daily spend was an opportunity for those in our business to be different and, and do different. And uh, that's, that's a, a core value of Newmark. It's a core objective of the way we're growing our business. It's not about being the biggest. It's about being the smartest, being the most technologically advanced, and being better at what we do. Yeah, so uh, the way we think about it, I mean, people talk about technology in our industry all the time, and I think they, in my opinion, um, conflate some different topics. So we think about uh, productivity enhancement. How do we do better the business of real estate brokerage, property management, appraisal, whatever the case may be? How can we enhance the ability to do that more productively? How can we enhance our ability to do that more consistently? So that's one category. Second category, which uh, Brandon nailed and you guys have been talking about this morning, is how do you interact with clients? And to me, that's the, the best frontier uh, that I've seen in technology, at least in my time in the industry, and that is how can you provide better information in context? That's a really key uh, element, uh, in my opinion, real time uh, to clients to drive value. One example, we uh, did a Skunk Works technology development uh, program about two and a half years ago uh, put three individuals with uh, computer science degrees in a lab down in Atlanta, and what they came up with was what we uh, now call Collier's 360, which was essentially a dashboarding tool for corporate clients that was totally platform agnostic. It didn't matter if they were on PeopleSoft, it didn't matter what their underlying data was uh, housed in, it would extract that data and in context uh, dashboard that information in real time. And that created a lot of value, it brought us closer to our clients, put us in a more strategic conversation. Uh, the third category of uh, technology, non-productivity enhancement, non-client related, to me is this whole notion of, are the brokerage firms gonna be technology companies? And that one I resist a little bit. I think if you look far enough out, I think that's probably the case, that all you know, commerce in the world will be digital in some form and fashion, I, I accept that. But I don't necessarily think that data uh, is going to be the value creation mechanism. I think data, to me, is going to be like storage was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I think it's going to be a commodity. Um, I was really struck by what you said about context again, Brandon, and the way we think about it is you've got data, you've got information, which is structured data, you've got knowledge, which is information and context, and then if you went all the way up the value chain, you'd have wisdom, which would be knowledge that is totally context independent. 
But I think a lot of people are playing in that data space, and I don't think that's where the value creation is. I think it's further up the food chain, in my opinion. So, um, uh, you know, I'll address technology as it relates to the investor side of, of the industry versus the occupier side. And um, I think it's um, at times um, easy to forget that we are all in the real estate investment business. And our job is to drive higher risk-adjusted returns for all of our upstream uh, clients and capital. And so I think our perspective is it is critical for us as an industry to bring transparency to what we do, how we do it, who we do it with, um, that there's integrity to the data. And so while the interface stuff is really exciting and critical to adoption, at the end of the day, we're focused on how are we gonna get all of this data into systems that we can cogently articulate what's going on in the market. And so our approach to it has been, one, I don't think we're skeptical about the value or the ability to deploy a CRM. I think we see CRM is foundational to our business, and it's not about one single application or software, it's about um, curating a number of software capabilities to leverage what we're trying to do. So one, I think us as an ind or we as an industry need to get behind the idea of open architecture. So, you know, it's one of the things that really moved Microsoft ahead early on. And so I would say that totally agree with uh, Nick's comment on focus. And we, I could say that our platform is comprised of 18, 20, 22 different core applications to bring it all together so we have a um, full view. And so we've chosen uh, not to go down the road of, in, of owning our own software at this point. Um, and it's because the uh, urgency is so high on all the fronts that we don't think we'll get there in time if we chose to do it ourselves, um, though we acknowledge it's critically important that it get done. And so, again, we're curating these relationships. We're involved in an incubator, um, uh, in Chicago, we're working with some private equity firms in terms of partnering on different experiments. And so we see these uh, um, efforts as kind of our R&D. So we're in it. I can tell you the fundamental change is the lack of resistance. So in the past, we got a lot of resistance from our professionals. Today, there's a lot of push that we're not moving fast enough. How come we miss this? How come we're not on it? And so I, I think it's a really exciting time, and I think we're in the first inning. Well, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, great comments. I guess the opening comment, I would say, just as it relates to a vision for CBRE, um, of how we think about technology, we, we, I'd say first, we're, we're very much trying to build a world-class company in, in products that then enable our professionals to get great outcomes for our clients, kind of in that order. So this whole idea of investing in about, in 2012, we, uh, we really told the market, we didn't think we were investing enough. Uh, if you go talk to a consultant, McKinsey or someone, they'll say, you know, world-class companies, financial services will spend anywhere from three to 5% of their revenue, gross revenue, uh, on IT. We weren't there. Uh, and we kind of told our board and we told the public markets, we're gonna, we're gonna start to invest. Uh, when, I, when I think about the ecosystem that we operate in, um, in, in terms of how we're attacking the technology uh, spend, we've made a significant increase uh, just in both in terms of OPEX and CAPEX investment into technology. And I'd, I'd kind of describe four different areas or ways that we do it. Uh, one is to buy, one is to build, one is to rent, and one is to partner. So under the buy category, this is kind of new space for all of us up here as we think about you know, real estate valuations for <coughs> services companies and you try to go look at acquiring firms that have a technology bent to them, they can be quite expensive. The multiples can make your head spin a little bit. So we try to rationalize how do we you know, take the traditional models as a real estate services provider and start to try to find great companies to buy that might be cultural fit, that aren't so far down the road that you can't buy them uh, and their valuations are just so uh, off the charts. So we've done a few of those things. Uh, Floored was a very uh, recent deal we just uh, did about six months ago. We, we uh, bought a company called Forum Analytics. We just bought Mainstream, kind of a work order management system. 
So there will be those things that we see that we can bring into our company that we're going to buy. Uh, there are going to be some things that we're going to build. We're doing a lot of things that are proprietary that we're building ourselves. They're unique to us. Uh, we're global. We're big. Uh, we've got that scale. And so how do, you know, what things do we need to do to drive all of our operations, uh, not just leasing, but all the client accounting facilities around the world and all the things that we do. So that's kind of the build and doing our own thing. And I'll talk maybe later about our, our kind of our new leader in, in that regard because we've made some big hires uh, in terms of our structure. Uh, the rent is uh, partnering with great firms like uh, VTS, CoStar, Microsoft products, and some things we just don't need to go build. Uh, they're already world class at what they do, and we're going to be great partners, and we'll be a big partner with them. Um, and then the last piece would be uh, kind of this partnership idea. Uh, we've uh, announced an investment with, with Fifth Wall Ventures, uh, where we're actually co-investing in this space, that pie chart, or, or the chart, the bar chart that showed all the uh, venture capital coming into the space. This gives us kind of a front row seat. Uh, as a company to see a lot of these early companies coming along. So not only as an investor potentially, but as a, as a, um, as a customer. Uh, so we're getting kind of some good insights there, uh, building a project management platform with a company called Kahua. So that's kind of a partner model. So that's how I, I would describe our strategy is along those four areas, but we've uh, made a significant commitment uh, in spend uh, in technology. M Mike, can you talk to us a little bit more about Florida and, and what the plan is? I think that the VTS team thought that was a really interesting play by CBRE and probably one that's most relevant for the people in this room. I mean, how do you guys actually plan on, on deploying that uh, across the platform? Yeah, well, there were, there were several things that were really interesting uh, about that deal to us. We, we uh, looked at it for a long time. Uh, Dave Eisenberg, I don't know if, if he's here, but um, there, there, was a, there, was a, there was tremendous interest in the product itself. You know, they had a couple of, of, of tools um, plan, what we, what we now call plan and what we call build, a visualization tool uh, as well as kind of a, a test fit tool. Uh, we thought that that was quite unique, especially for the landlord owner. Uh, so we saw that, we said we want to own that. Uh, that's something that we think would be a differentiator for us. So there was tremendous interest in the products, but then also the DNA and the, and the talent. Um, it's, it's rare for us, I mean, we all know the real estate world, but for us to be able to go get a, a small team, relatively small team, a really, really strong talent of, of uh, software engineers and visionaries that we thought could take our traditional areas of business and, and help us try to continue to be a leader in this industry. So that was a big, those two dimensions, I would say both the products themselves, not only the current ones, but the ones that they could do to help influence our other products we thought would be kind of a shot in the arm for our, 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 our own culture um, on the talent side. Thank you, Greg. So I think there, if you break our industry into investors, which would really be mostly this room, and occupiers, um, I think this is one case where particularly the large occupiers have kind of driven us ahead faster. So if you really want to see um, maybe second or third inning, you can look at the biggest global outsourcing clients who are now coming to, to us and, and others on this stage and saying, I want you to be our, our technology provider. So what have they asked us to do and what have they asked us not to do? Well, first of all, their, their data is theirs and when you go in, they really don't even understand their portfolios, their spend, how they can get control over both cost and how they can drive value for their customers who are, are their employees and how they can you know, really win the, the war for talent at the end of the day. So they, they came to us and said, you need to have deep expertise in data, in analytics, in business intelligence, and you need to be able to provide us insights that will come out in a form very similar to what we saw earlier that'll be dashboards. So the biggest global um, occupiers today, uh, you know, use us and others to really visualize all of their information from the transactions they're working on to their capital programs, to the facilities management, and they can then use that data and strategies that change the way they provide incentives and do other things to really drive their portfolio in the right way and get the right outcomes, which isn't always cost, it's a lot of things. How do they want to do that? They want to own their own data at the end of the day. And we thought very early on it was going to be built. And I think, you know, Mike could probably say that, Joe and everyone here would, that we're going to probably need to build it. And we realized very quickly that really what they want us to do is be an integrator. So we use, uh, we refer to it as point solutions that really attack in that focus that Brandon was talking about before, you know, people focusing on areas of the life cycle for an occupier. And there, there's a life cycle for investors too. And I think the investor world will follow this path. Our job is to integrate around in, in ways that are consistent, 
that allows you to, to bring your data in in different ways and give you dashboards. Our red data and analytics platform sits on top of lots of different programs. We can provide the point solutions and integrate it, or we can sit on top of an IWMS system and provide you uh, with individual point systems and really make it fit for the massive investments that our occupier clients and candidly probably a lot of you have done. So today our world is, is really buy, build, and partner. And, and partner and rent, probably the same thing a little bit, a little bit Mike, and the way Mike described it. You know, we're buying companies you know, because they have great products, and I'll talk about a couple in a second, but we're also buying them because they totally changed the discussion in our rooms, or in our digital boards, which we have for each of our businesses. They changed the discussion with people who started, their DNA is really around digital and technology and analytics. That's very different than the traditional analog businesses we have. So we're, we're doing a, a great job uh, with buy then, then building. We still build that integration piece. And then we're partnering. VTS is a great example of that. There are going to be cent centerpiece point solutions who might end up hitting a few points on the overall life cycle. But then our clients are coming to us saying, fill the holes and bring it together for me and allow it to speak to me at a different level. So I think there's a lot of room for, for partnering as we go forward. On the buy side, we bought a facilities management SaaS company called Corrigo. And they're really helping us totally change the cost structures and the data gathering in our facilities management, and it'll be in our property management business as well. Uh, we bought a, a technology consulting company called BRG. And all they do is help people who have large stacks that would be very hard to walk away from because of the charges they'd have and make them all work along with data visualization at the top. So the answer isn't we're gonna find one solution. The answer is everybody's in a different spot. The occupiers are all in a different spot and investors are all in a different spot. And our job is to bring it together and integrate it and it's gonna be something that's gonna, uh, gonna hit us all over time. So it is a massive investment, a lot like Mike's comments, you know, the percentage of our revenue that we're spending on technology and R&D around our businesses. We've reorged our entire IT department which used to be plumbing. The plumbing department is separate and they do a great job at keeping our people productive and doing other things. Each of our businesses has a dedicated CIO focused only on how we can bring customer outcomes. And that's a massive shift for us over the last really couple of years and the pace of that change is unbelievable. Thank you. Well, I think the other, one of the, uh, the key things we wanted to focus on and, and probably two of the most common terms that get thrown around when people talk about real estate technology is disruption and enablement. So if you think about how much the, the space has evolved over the last couple of years, there are now hundreds of, co of companies trying to solve dozens of different problems within the space. But the real question for you guys is, is where do you think that we'll see real disruption versus enablement? And I think most importantly and most interesting, uh, interestingly for the people in this room is, how do you think the role of the broker will change over the next five years? I just, I would like to comment on Greg, which is part of that. So we've been doing, we've been doing that for, for seven, eight years on the, uh, the dashboard and the information and the analytics. And, the, and uh, uh, we bought a company called Computer Facilities Integration several years ago. And uh, it's very, very similar to BRG, as well as other, other technology companies that we've put together. And we do partner, and we do rent. But uh, if, if, you, if you're gonna build something, you should own the information. You should, um, you should, you should control the, the long-term destiny and invest the capital. If you're willing to invest the money, you'll have a, a long-term differentiating value. And that's where we, we see the industry going. Uh, for us, it's been about differentiation. We we weren't the biggest, so we always felt that we had to be we had to be different. So we've been coming in through the technology door over the years, and now we're building out the dots on the map and the distribution capability and the talent on the ground, which will never be eliminated. Uh, it may be disintermediated to a degree, and it may be deleveraged, but the uh, the requirement to empower the brokers. Uh, to uh, have access to information on mobile, accessible, flexible, complete, which will include some built internally, some subscription-based bolt-ons, and access to public data as well. So it'll be a combination of all of the above. And, and at the end of the day, the broker will be that instrument 
to create, uh, to be the intermediary. But unlike in the past, it may be, you know, you, you're going to have very senior brokers. They're going to be very smart. They'll be well trained. They'll understand technology. They'll be able to access that information. They'll be able to interpret the information. And uh, they'll be way more empowered. Uh, that's that's our, our objective. Uh, it's more towards the integrator model, as Greg talked about, as opposed to just, you know, just more is more, and one and one equals one and a half. Uh, our, our view is, you know, in, in terms of the broker side of our business, we're about revenue per capita. We're about the quality of the individuals. We're about differentiation and capability. On the, on the, on the investor side of it, um, everything's about yield. Everything's about what sliver or increasing the yield, and technology is going to be available at some point to increase that yield. And if the brokers don't create the value, they'll be eliminated. So at the, if, if the information are readily available for the investor to increase their return on investment, and they don't need brokers, they'll be eliminated. So uh, I think the brokerage industry has to be on their toes and has to be ready for the challenge uh, to, to, uh, to create the value so that these guys don't eliminate the business. And if we don't, then we will be. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a host of things, so but in your, it's important. So in your view, it sounds like you believe there will always be brokers, but maybe less brokers. And is there, a, is there a scenario, and I'd love to hear the answer from all you guys, I mean, is there, a, over the next five years, is, are there scenarios where you just don't need a broker for small deals, maybe less than 10,000 square feet? Personally, I think, you know, look, Every, every I, I, I get a kick out of when you guys come in and visit with us and you're telling us how you want to partner with us and we need your support and we love you guys and we need you guys and I'm thinking, okay, this guy's thinking about how does he eliminate us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, really? Um, so uh, I don't believe, I look, on the residential side, what a broker does is, is limited. So Zillow, for example, what I found in the last few years, that if you're looking for an apartment, it's much harder to be on the buy side because it's friction, it has so much friction. You gotta show people. The guy who's sitting with the listing, it's much easier. So Zillow sends people to the listing. Will, will people go just to the location and buy directly? It's unlikely that someone's gonna want some stranger wandering through their apartment. So I, see, I think what it may do is may reduce the amount of the buy side on the residential. Uh, I, I, th I don't think it works on the 5,000 footer, actually. I mean, you may think it does, but they have let a larger tenant can afford more professional help to leverage themselves into solutions. So I don't think the risk is in the 5,000. I think it's the opposite. The risk is more likely on the larger who decide they want, want well, I'm just going to hire this great broker and he's going to work internally and he's going to go directly do, do deals. Now, I don't believe, I believe that uh, I wouldn't come to work every day if I didn't think we provide enough nuanced informational value. And, you know, sheer, uh, you know, one of my partners, David Falk, sent her book around hug your customer. You know, I could find a, an apartment, but I, I want to talk to a broker. I, I like to have someone I'm who's there, who's going to be the concierge of everything I need. I want someone at my side advising me every step of the way. And you can't have a relationship with an owner. You know which owner behaves which way, what the building's like, the systems of the building. If you're not bringing something to the party, you are going to be out of business. And it requires way more than just knowing what street and what space and, and using an algorithm to decide which building meets with the tenant. You know, they, you know it's, I mean, I, for that matter, I could do my own taxes. Um, so I, I don't think it gets eliminated, but I do, think, I do think the leverage changes, I think the information changes, I think brokerage industry is, is gonna be way more sophisticated. Uh, I, you know, the old school brokers, over, it's over. And if, you, you're not, if you're not advancing, if you're not changing, if you don't come in every single day and think, how could I get better? How could I get smarter? What could I learn today? Every single broker, then you're going to be out of business eventually. I, I would totally agree with you, Phil. Yeah, so I, um, I'm a believer in industry dynamics. So I used to give a 
internal presentation on industry consolidation. I started about eight years ago. And about four years into that presentation, people were amazed that the boxes that I sort of had circled were starting to come together and do deals. And I said, how did you know that? That's, that's unbelievable. I said, it's very simple. It's, it's industry dynamics that every industry is subject to. So I think this notion that real estate is somehow different from disruption or that the disruptive forces will play out differently in real estate, I think is just not accurate. And so if you look at how disruption happens, disruption always happens at the bottom of the market, always. I'm a Tesla owner and someone who owns a Tesla said, no Dylan, that's not true. Tesla is an example of disruption from the top. And I actually disagree. I think what Tesla has done is use the top of the market to brand themselves but if you look at their stock being at an all-time high and above General Motors and Ford, it's because of the Model 3. That's what people are betting on. So disruption always comes from the bottom of the market. Always, always, always. If you look at the camera phone and how it was on a flip phone, your Motorola StarTech, you know, no one in their right mind would ever think that that would disrupt a Pentax digital camera, but it has. Or that a uh, cell phone itself or a smartphone itself would disrupt the PC, but it has. So it always happens at the bottom of the market, and typically it happens for the reasons Barry just articulated, which is the larger firms say, you know what, that's garbage business. Auction.com selling a 2,000 square foot industrial building online, who cares? 1,000 square foot liquid space posted on you know, Craigslist, who cares? But the fact of the matter is if you have a solution that starts eating away and is good enough for the bottom of the market, eventually they get enough forward momentum and they get enough client concentration and they get enough insight that that solution becomes good enough. And then of course you reach a tipping point and the whole thing inverts. So I do think Barry's right at the very, very highest level of the market. If you look at investment banking or, or um, you know, the financial services market, the very top of what Goldman Sachs does has not been disrupted by Charles Schwab, clearly. But it cannibalizes the bottom of the market and it happens a lot quicker than people think. And so I believe, you know, within the next 24 months, I do think the smaller deals will be done proportion, disproportionately with non, call it big five firms. I do think some of the co-working models, some of the liquid space models, some of the, call it uh, pseudo brokerage uh, models that are kicking around are going to take market share. I do believe that. So I think that's what we're in for. How will the broker role change? I think just the term broker to me is already outdated. I mean, it really is an advisory role. And if you're not driving strategic value, and as Greg and others have said, in an integrated way, if you can't play in an integrated space, you're dead. But that's true, I think, of any professional service, uh, or it should be. And to me, real estate is just lagging a little bit what's happening in investment banking and some of the others. So um, my take on it is um, your, the nomenclature in terms of broker. I mean, let's be absolutely honest with each other. All of us are brokers in the room and none of us are brokers in the room. Um, we're all intermediaries between the capital and the opportunity and how we're incented or compensated or paid may differ depending on the models. Um, I don't think that relationship between the capital and the opportunity is going to change very much. Now, how it gets exploited or executed, those uh, models could probably change pretty dramatically. And an example I would use in the security side of the business is the shift from actively managed money market funds to passively managed ETFs. So the ability for um, smaller, less in, uh, sophisticated investors to get to products um, and opportunities that they, they have a desire to get to, that probably goes up around technology. Um, I think the most sophisticated investors are going to see all of us is the ability to access important relationships and to give them some kind of differentiator in a world where all of the data is going to be pretty much ubiquitous. Um, <clears throat> In terms of enablers, um, even though we're in the first inning of technology, um, the mindset, the culture, and the technology are way ahead of the process in the business. And so when we're talking about a 50-page unique lease for 2,500 footer for 18 months, that is insane. 
when you can trade billions of dollars of bonds under that very building or portfolio like that. So if you want to talk about disruption or enablement, the ability to do this stuff more efficiently in terms of the process is bigger opportunity than the technology itself. And that's, you know, kudos to VTS and Hightower for acknowledging that that's where the opportunity is, is to automate that component of the process that's so efficient, but the deliverables around it are like, I mean, we're walking around with dinosaur bones. Uh, I would say as it relates to the question around the role of the broker, clearly going to the advisory and consulting side, expertise, deep uh, industry knowledge around a product. So the specialization that we've all seen, if you're doing a law firm deal, you've got to have law firm expertise. If you're doing a data center deal, you've, you, you've got to speak data center. Um, all the things that are uh, kind of moving, uh, about a year ago, we actually changed the name of our leasing business. And I'd say the same is true in the capital markets space. You know, you're, you're, you're compartmentalized by um, a product type, um, in a geography, very specialized, really deep expertise. That's where it's going. About a year ago, we rebranded uh, our brokerage business to advisory and transaction services business. We did that for a very good reason because we said, you know, it's no longer just about doing the deal and the transaction. Yes, you've got to be competent. You've got to know the market. You've got to know the lease. But bringing in the expertise and the advice is what our clients want on both sides, the occupier and, and the landlord. On the disruption question, um, you know, I think the things that's, that tend to be disrupted uh, first and foremost are the, the, the two obvious ones for me would, would be the things that are uh, the Internet of Things connected, where the connectedness smart buildings, we're already seeing a tremendous innovation there. Uh, we're doing some things with JCI uh, around the Innovations Lab and ESI Energy. So energy management, buildings where, and those are just efficiencies that are, that are happening uh, very, very quickly. The other are, are machine learning kind of uh, areas where uh, robotics will start to come into play. So you can take things like loan servicing, perhaps valuations, and some of those other things that have a process around them that's got a lot of manual uh, labor involved that could be automated. Uh, those things, I think, clearly uh, are in the uh, are in the crosshairs of disruption, but I would all, I'd put a different spin on it rather than disruption. I would just say in, enablement. We see a lot more on the enablement side. I, we don't see huge disruption on the transactional That's services side. That's the Texas side. coming out and him, you know, <laughs> yeah. versus yeah. the New York over here. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we, we do see a lot of enablement uh, on the leasing and the and the capital market side, but not tremendous uh, disruption uh, there, at least not in the near future. But certainly watching all of it very, very closely. You know, our, our clients don't think about the services as we talk about them. So whether it's advisory and tenant services or, or leasing, however we talk about them, what they think about is, can you get me to my solution? And solutions to problems clients have don't fit in historical leasing or our project development business to build the capital side or property or facilities management. They fit with the facts of what an individual client needs. Long ago, our professionals became part of teams because that's how we can go bring solutions. No one, our very best relationship brokers are not going to go out and master data analytics and BI. You look at the demographics of that group, they're actually somewhat afraid of it. So we're going to use a tried and true approach that many here use and we've created a team orientation around what's the problem, now let's define how we need to put the right people, the right skill sets around that relationship person so we can build the right solution. And some of them will be solutions that we'll bring together consistently because we see a common problem, but the brokers, uh, the, uh, the ones who've been around a long time, maybe getting a little older in their career, what we're gonna have to do in the short term is build digital scaffolding around them. And that's a big part of, of what we're doing today. That's also going to give us a tremendous opportunity to really bring some diversity into our industry because the skill sets around data science, computer science, a lot of those disciplines, when you go, and I can tell you the computer science class my, my son just graduated with is a rainbow coalition. It's unbelievable how diverse it is. And we can attract those people to these new job opportunities that will be within our business. In order to build those kinds of solutions, you have to have a culture or teams at the top. And that's something we work extremely hard at, that being open to the other ideas and how we bring solutions together. 
But I will say this, every one of our businesses, because we have business line leads and geographic leads as we have continued to scale the business, every one of them will be tech-enabled businesses. And some of them will end up being disrupted by tech businesses. I happen to believe really small things will start getting done in other ways, whether it's a direct technology, or uh, you look at what WeWork's done. And I know uh, Dave's gonna speak tomorrow, uh, what WeWork's done is, is bring out of mom's basement and a lot of other places, lots of smaller users initially, uh, but as I think Ryan said earlier, you know, they're now working with the corporates. So they're gonna be a big part, big part of our strategic work um, for our portfolios for our big clients is, where does co-working in general fit into their portfolios? We weren't talking about that two years ago, but that flexibility and other things is gonna give us opportunities. So there's gonna be some disruption at the low end, but we're going to have teams that look a lot different to bring these skill sets in, and we'll do best for our clients when we knit all that together, and that's our, that's our goal. Thank you. So uh, next question is, might be a, a little controversial, but it actually came up in our, uh, our customer advisory board meeting yesterday, and, and this concept of thinking about compensation and tying it to a more of a performance-based model. I think Mark Zakakis had a pretty awesome example of thinking about how his asset managers um, are, are comped on performance. I mean, that's just the way the asset management business works. And then having a subset of that, which is comp based on technology. So how well are you actually leveraging technology? So do you guys see an evolution of the brokerage business where it does become more of a performance-based compensation model? And could technology, be, the utilization of technology be, be tied to that? Because I think a big part of, of what's happening in the industry now, and the question that people are asking is, you know, how do we get it to change? Um, and you talked about building digital scaffolding, and, and there's lots of creative ways that people have been approaching it, but any thoughts on just taking it, taking it more head on? It, it should be, it isn't. I mean, the, the, the procurement has destroyed uh, the efficacy of much of what's done. You know, it's, everything's a nail, everything's a hammer. Uh, every broker is a broker. Uh, the commodity aspect of what we do is unfortunately, I think, over-exaggerated. Uh, because not every leasing agent is, is good is the same as another leasing agent. And too much of that is done. Uh, performance is, is as good as any way to, to, to get paid. Um, now it's, well, you're, you're the same as everybody else. We just like you to, we'll pay you less. And uh, so that's, that's, that's not a good, that's not in the interest of the client, in my view. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think there should be a, should be a component of uh, how people are paid based on performance and success. And having better information might be a better way to judge that. Uh, so there is some, some of that, some of that in, in, in facilities and other parts of the business where you, you do have some element of fee at risk based on a certain amount of performance. But, but I'm, you know, I see it as a, as a good thing. Greg, did you wanna pop in there? You know, especially as you're knitting together solutions. Uh, you know, more and more of our clients are, and have for a long time in the occupier side, particularly the big ones, it's outcome-based pricing. You know, here's my portfolio and what I'm spending, you know, at the transaction side because there's so many other variables there, but in facilities management and other areas, there are glide paths and other things that we deal with, we deal with all the time. The more we can bring together things that really create different value and we can attack that better, the more clients are willing to pay us. So, you know, when we spend time with clients, whether they're occupiers or investors, we talk about what their real goals are, and the more we can align ourselves with those goals, the better. Um, all of the technologies, whether it's automation or providing better information, <coughs> should allow our professionals to raise the revenue per professional, but I don't have a single client who's going to pay us more unless we drive more value. So that's got to be the focus, and you're going to do that <clears throat> in, a, in a number of different ways, aren't we already largely in an outcome-based you know, world in a lot of our businesses? I think we're not. Cool, Mike, you wanna come yeah, back? I, to I would say I think the occupier world is, is certainly ahead of, uh, in the world of kind of KPIs and alignment. That's how they, those contracts are structured. They're big, they're global, they're multi-year, and you can, you know, and the providers will get some certainty for activity and put some skin in the game. When it's transactional and it's kind of one-off, you know, we end up either in this property management fee assignment uh, relationship or commission relationship. By the way, the, the commission, as you know, is not, it's not a global thing necessarily. So if you went to the UK, the market there is very much of a team, kind of a base bonus profit sharing model. Every compensation system that I've seen has some flaw in it. Profit sharing, 
you know, limits people's willingness to invest back in the business. So they don't want to give up current year's profits because it's going to, uh, you know, for future gains. So they, they, all of these things are, are a little tricky and complicated. At the end of the day, though, I think it is our collective duty uh, as an industry to take KPIs and metrics to you, the investor client, and really elevate the game. Uh, we're doing a lot of work ourselves just on our own client care programs and trying to think, think about what are the things that we can measure and roll up. Even though you buy from us one off, you know, how can we roll that up and measure it and report back to you on how we're doing relative to leasing performance? Are we getting, are we improving market share? Are you getting more than your market share? How are we doing relative to your NOI? How are we doing relative to your satisfaction of your tenants? So I think, uh, I think we need to be doing a better job of that. Uh, but it's not always just the compensation systems. Those are just kind of some, some necessary evils. Somebody, and, and there's some great things about a commission structure. Um, but the more we can create alignment, where what's, what defines success for the client is success for the provider, is uh, it's a great place to be. So um, I, I'd kind of parse the question into mm -hmm. two buckets. One is how are fees calculated? And I do think that there's uh, some interesting um, examples out there where service providers are trying to figure out ways to get compensated more for more value add or even be penalized for missing targets. And so I do think those are starting uh, to appear out there. Uh, the other part of the, comp the question is compensation in the industry. And I think I would go to Greg's team approach um, if you look at even straight brokerage that's just getting a commission, very few of the most successful brokers aren't pooling fees with a team. So, um, you know, and they're either, you know, everybody's got a fixed percentage or they whack it up every quarter, every year. The idea that you 100% eat what you kill I think is in the rear view mirror. I think there's a lot of collaboration at the team level. There's a lot of collaboration where those fees get diverted to other services within the team in order um, to get them compensated. So I feel gr pretty good about where natural progression is taking us there, and I think it's fine for that to happen naturally. Where I think us as leaders need to force it is for the junior talent because we have to demonstrate that we can attract the best and brightest as a company, as an industry, and we won't do it by putting somebody on an independent contractor agreement and on a draw. So I think that for the first three to five years, you are gonna very rapidly see more kind of salary bonus type um, compensation with certain behavioral or efforts targets, like I think we were alluding to. Um, I, I don't think commission or a piece of the revenue goes away for the, for the senior talent uh, anytime soon. Cool. Uh, just quickly, Mike made, a, I think, a really important point, which is, you know, we're talking about a US-centric view, and, and globally, it's actually quite a bit different. On the capital market side, I see a lot of incentive-based compensation, not only in terms of how we're paid as a firm, but how the team is compensated. The other thing that I think is really interesting is this whole rise of non-US or non-North American multinational companies. And uh, there's a lot of them. And they're now starting to export business around the world. And they think about it quite a bit differently than what Barry pointed out earlier, which is they're not as procurement driven as the US uh, multinational corporations are. In a lot of cases, they're first generation outsourcing. And so they're really looking for value. So I think this might be one area where the global uh, dynamics actually affect the U.S. dynamics. Uh, and, you know, normally it's the other way around, as we know. But I do welcome everything that's been said here. I think incentive-based compensation, both with the client covenant, but also internally, I think is critical. And if you look at some of the boutiques, like an East Hill or HFF, who do really well on the landlord side, a lot of their compensation is very communal. And I think, I think that drives behavior. Thank you very much, guys. That's, clearly, there's a, there's a lot to take away here, and it sounds like you guys are thinking about a lot on a daily basis. And I think we do have some time for, for questions, so we'd love to open it up to the, uh, the audience. Someone's got to have a good question. I mean, what if I say something stupid? 
Um, talking about data, one of my big frustrations is as an asset manager, there's data that's my data, and there's data that's market data, lease comps, sale comps, right? What do you guys, I, I would love to hear y'all's thoughts on as we move forward, the notion of each individual market, each firm in each market maintaining a data set, sales comps and lease comps, and then there's data in CoStar, there's data all over the place. Which one is kind of the truth? And I've seen at least you know one firm represented up here where every market report across the U.S. looks the exact same, and I appreciate that. And I see other other organizations where there's still a lot of protection within a market of, oh, that's my information. I, if I start to share that, I'm giving up some of my power. So I'd love to hear you know what you guys think about the evolution of you know market intelligence, not just for us in this room, the information that we own, that's, that's kind of ours, but the information that we rely on to make decisions on our buildings. That's a great question. Anyone want to kick it off? Well, the further you get away from the document and the actual deal, I mean, I've seen comps on deals that I know, and, and they vary the further you get away, right? So some of the services that aggregate data it's hard to get to the actual deal. There's often confidentiality, so you get generalities about this and around that. Uh, never mind where the shell condition is and the TIs and how you get there. So I think for each of us, the individual that will know some data will be absolute. And then there'll be other data that we'll, we'll collect, and whether it comes from any one of our clients and anonymize, so that we can look at it as a pool and gather things from it. But the best <coughs> insights will come from the deep facts. And, and how we get there. Getting the consistency market to market, how are we gonna bring that information and solutions to you, maybe around some point solutions like VTS and other things we have, that's the next step for all of us as we embrace you know, data analytics and BI, is to start to bring that to you in the right way. VTS has a nice core, but there'll be other information around it, and you want as much as you can get to create differentiation, so. You know, you could, you could look, if you look at the, uh, the genome, as be the way that the way all the health institutions, if the U.S. had every DNA sequence of every U.S. citizen on a regular basis, we'd cure disease in 15, 20 years. And what happens is you have the New York Genome Center, you have places like MD Anderson, Memorial Sloan Kettering. They, none of them share their branded DNA sequencing. They contribute some of it to a central repository but they won't share it. So uh, what you have, we're right now in sort of the Neanderthal phase where um, we all have our own data. There's different data even internally, and it's not just a national thing. It's even, you could, if you ask for a comp in a, in, a, in a market, you'll see there are certain nuances of a transaction that are hard to get unless you read the lease. So till the, till the ownership decides, that they're just going to release that data, and it's not necessary. They want everybody else's, but they don't want to put their own in. And that, and that, you know, and there's there's a bunch of guys that are struggling and fledgling around. And uh, my view of the world, and I tell my own research guys who have their own territorial interests, it's go. We are going to be disrupted in that space. Get over it. Accept it. Figure out how to get the information to a central repository because if. Thousands of people contribute information, it'll be a solution. And if we think that by hiding that little piece of information nuance is really going to keep us in business, eventually someone's going to figure it out. We'll be out of business anyway. So um, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in change and disruption as part of our uh, industry. So, so I think the problem with getting consistent data is there's just too much friction, too many self-interested parties. Too many people who you know want other people's information, not willing to give up their own. And at some point, just like in Wall Street, they eventually everybody decided, oh, we're going to just give the information out. And then you had all these uh, zippers and Bloomberg and other parties, and the information became open and available. And there's there are companies out there that are trying, but you got to fight your own battles internally, and you got to fight with each other, and you got to fight against your own uh, instincts. Uh, John, you have a question? Um, with, uh, your 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, the experience of winning, uh, helping your agents win the business, um, when, when competing against, you know, each other in regions from, you know, I think JLL, you had this uh, really cool GPS kind of perspective on things, CB as well, I've seen some awesome things from all your firms, but just how you focus on that, what it means, because winning business is everything, and if you can measure that on, uh, from an ROI perspective over time and measure the data on the success or, or not. I'll take a stab at that. Okay, Just, sure. uh, and we, we, we thought a lot about this with the Florida acquisition. You know, they've got products, they've got revenue, but there will be exhaust revenue if we, if we win 1% more of the time because we have this tool. You could start to uh, extrapolate some ROI on that investment, but it's very hard to do, I would say. Um, the same with a form analytics where it's, it's site at, you know, selection expertise for our retail practice. At the end of the day, are we growing EPS and are we, are we enabling and putting in the hands of our professionals tools that help them in a collaborative way get more insights? Um, so it's, I would say it's hard uh, when, you're, when you're investing in that technology to, try, to tie it exactly to, are we just keeping our market share or are we gaining market share by those, by those investments? Um, we'll, we will do our best to try to you know, estimate uh, what's the potential lift for this investment. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about are we serving our clients well? Are we getting great outcomes? Are we are we uh, empowering the business? And in and the overall scheme of things, you know, hopefully growing the business. Um, and you have hard. spin and omission. It's like the CBO. You, you, you the information if it's put in is going to is going to be for what the return is, how well somebody's doing versus another is going to be decided as to the input. If the information is inaccurate or weighted, or there are some omissions. You know, it'll be whose information is right. There's always going to be some of that. Yeah, listen, we're just at the point where we're now measuring every pitch and did we win it or lose it. So we're not at an ROI level. We just want to know, you know, what, what are basic metrics around the efforts. And I, I think we'll get to ROI. Whether we'll ever be able to isolate that to technology, I, I, I don't know because, um, I think a lot of the pitch, while there's substance to it, it's still about, it, there's, st there's still bells and whistles, and some of that's been technology, that may be less technology going forward. Um, I will go back to the previous question about this data, because the biggest challenge we've had around our integration of the companies is the quality and consistency of the historic data. It's not the systems, it's not the processes, it's that data migration, data transition. Um, and so we've looked at um, permissions around data kind of in three buckets. One is on transactions or events that have happened, so past, those that are in, currently in process, which is current, and then future. Um, I think we have a long way to go before people start widely sharing, and we may never get there, want to get there, future opportunity. Um, I think we're pretty good on the past. We've got to get better. I think you guys have to get better. I mean, in all candor, the asset managers really do covet this information is, is your own, and I guess understandably, but literally two weeks later, you'll go out, put a bond offering out, and all that data is out there in the public markets, and we're getting beaten up because somebody shared a comp. So I think there's a lot of transparency um, in Barry's camp here, as I often am, Barry, um, that uh, the, we got to give up this idea that the data itself has value. Transparency has value. And I can tell you in the markets where there's more transparency, I would argue that there's slightly lower cap rates. The markets that you go to and you say, hey, the service providers don't collaborate, they're fighting, they don't share, those markets tend to not be quite as valuable. So I would go to, let's get as much of the past out there as we can, let's share as much of the present as appropriate, and then the future stuff is probably where the differentiator is. Just on the, on the pitch question, just uh, quickly on that, uh, we do measure conversion rate, that's an important metric of course, and some of the new technologies, I know we have some VCs here, PitchBook, if you use that, with the written document, the thing I like about that, you can see who opened it, you can see how long they spent on different sections of the presentation. That provides some insight. Um, what we found though, it goes back to what Barry said earlier, if you leverage the technology to demonstrate 
how you're different or how your service is going to be different and personalize it, we found that the technology really enables that, and that's when you see the conversion rate actually start to increase. And then just back to, to Joe's point, I couldn't agree more. As I said earlier, I think the data really is a commodity. Even if we were, Larry, to tell you, here's the comps, the lease rate in this market is going up $2 next year, for sure, 100%, you still would want to know, okay, what should I do? Should I sell? If I sell, what do I buy? So I think the, the data is important to provide the information so we all agree on the facts, but it's really the insight. It's really, okay, what do I do about that? And to me, that's the key thing. So I'm with Joe. I think opaque markets trade at a discount in my opinion, because you don't have enough information. It restricts commerce. When you restrict commerce, the prices are lower. Thanks, guys. We'll time for one more question right back here. Uh, so, hi. Uh, so as far as like, all the technology, which is great, and you know, I think a lot of people talk about it and pitch it all the time, and as someone who's been using you know, VTS for a few years now, I find one of the biggest hurdles I have is actual adoption by brokers to actually, whether they're more senior brokers, generally pushed down to the junior guy on the totem pole to just kind of put deal info in. A lot of it is, is at times garbage. It's just everyone in the market just gets dumped into VTS or you know some other product without me actually knowing what's real valuable information. So what are you doing to drive that adoption kind of throughout the ranks so that over time we're building this strong data that you know maybe at some point we can all put out there you know without any names on it to everyone and share that data to make everyone more effective? Well, I'll give you an idea there. I mean, just to use VTS uh, as an example, or Hightower. So the original pitch, if you recall, was to brokers about, hey, this is gonna make you more effective and you're going to you know, win more and you're gonna get more money, so appealing to greed. Uh, that didn't work very well. And then where it took off was the pivot to going to you guys and then you all saying to all of us, if you don't lose it, you're gonna lose, or if you don't use it, you're gonna lose business. So kind of appear, appealing to the, the fear. I think the fear of getting left behind is starting to you know, hit the individuals in our industry who've been resisting it. And if they haven't been left behind yet, they're gonna be left behind really, really pretty shortly. And I also think the desire, expectation, requirement of collaboration is increasing people's desire to adopt all this stuff. So I don't see the resistance as a big an issue as it was a year or two ago. I would say change management is a big part. You know, there's some that will resist, you know, kind of going into something. If you talk about a CRM, if everybody's not in and putting the data in, it's not going to be any good. Uh, and if the products aren't any good, it's also not going to work. So I don't know how many remember Octane. Several of us up here on this stage, uh, you know, invested 15 years ago in building something and the product came out, it was not user friendly, it was terrible. Uh, and a lot of money went down the drain. So the, the, the products have to be really good. Um, and what are we doing about it? It's just, it's training. It, it is kind of market by market, trying to get through sales management process, people to realize the, the cheese moved. It, it moved a long time ago. And if you're not using these tools, you're gonna to be left behind and you're gonna, and so, I, but the tools themselves But there's, have there's to be good. nothing for people like success in the company and that somebody else gets to. As I, I say a lot, we, we have precious few innovators. Innovation really is something that's amazing. We have a lot of really good mimics. And people watch it, you start with a classic adoption curve, the early, early movers get in there, and they start going, and then you start to get others, and then people see the success, and it all floats up, they hear from you, the clients, and then they go after it. We're actually trying to change the discussion uh, with our teams on certain technologies from adoption, and there are some you're sampling, and you let people adopt them, to deployment. So in some of the things that we're doing, we will deploy this technology across because it's in the best interest of the client and we need to get there. It's a heavy lift, we're gonna all go do that together. People, so we gotta change that mentality a little bit. People will be lazy. That's just a fact. So, uh, unless they're forced to do something. I mean, they're just, you know, if you can get away with it, they won't do it. And Brandon, you remember the first time we met? Remember what I, what I said to you guys? Uh, I said, you, the idea of technology is to make life easier for people, right? And I said, you guys haven't really figured that out yet. You just make our brokers work harder because they have to input this every minute, every, every second. So, so the way I looked at it in the beginning was that this is really a hall monitor or, or a, for the, 
the, the owners, so that on the night before the meeting, the weekly meeting, they don't just sit and put all this stuff together. I showed the space. This is who I showed the space. I think that keeps a certain amount of discipline going, and it's actually a good idea. But in respect of, of uh, technology, in our CRM, we have a hammer. And if you don't put in the information into the CRM, you get hit with the hammer. And if, if you, and the other hammer is you're out of business hammer. You know, you, 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 you can't teach a, do a old dog new tricks. So you're not getting the superstar rock stars who, who have white hair to figure out how to, you know, get into the computer. It's just not happening. So, so it's going to be, you just got to hope that the, the third guy on the team, that young guy, works his ass off. He's probably underpaid. He's probably pissed off. But he's, but he's working his ass off, making sure that the information is in that technology, and he's trying like hell to teach the old dog how to open it up. <laughs> so it's, you know, there's nothing. Everything in life is hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's a constant grind. You guys know that. In New this York, is, definitely. It's everywhere. Come on. You know, this is, we're, we're not, we're, I mean, I grew up in New York, but, but uh, we, we run a, a global company. It's, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, and it's like other people in other markets. You know, my, our San Francisco guys, they're real chill. Baloney. They're, they're just passive-aggressive, that's all. <laughs> and, the, and, and the guys in Texas, you know, oh, we're easy. You know, baloney. <laughs> they just have an accent. I think the number one takeaway from this conference is that people from San Francisco are passive aggressive. Hundred percent, I'm convinced of it, and they're convinced of it. Right, so, we, have, we have time for right. one, one. We're going to do one more question. Uh, first of all, thanks to the VTS team, Nick and Brandon. I mean, great panel and opportunity to hear you guys. As far as when you make a uh, selection as to a new technology venture or going with VTS, who makes up the advisory team? Is it a bunch of, let's just, you know, as Barry puts it, white hairs, or do you have millennials and all of that saying you, why should, we should uh, buy into this? How do you make that decision? Who's involved in advising you within your companies? I'm happy to go first. Um, so we have Dan Spiegel in the audience, who's our EVP of operations for the U.S. He had a really good idea probably about six years ago to form a, essentially a technology council among some of our top producers, some of the younger, more innovator uh, type personalities in the firm. So you kind of not only get the good ideas on that advisory board, but you also get people who, if they adopt it, other people are going to be influenced by their adoption. So that's served us very well. It depends a little bit on whether it's a regional initiative or a global initiative. If it's a global initiative, then obviously I would be involved in, in, in some cases, our board in selecting that, depending on what the CapEx uh, commitment is. If it's a regional initiative, U.S. only, uh, I might be involved, but typically would be the person running the business or maybe the business unit. We're big believers, and I know others on the stage are as well, of incubating uh, products and, and piloting before you go full bore because you want to see the adoption, you want to see the value creation before you really jump in. I think the scale in this business requires change management, as Mike said, and you're not going to get the change management unless you have seeds of success and you get seats of success with a pilot. So that's how we think about it. So was your question, how do we pick or how do we engage? What involved in helping you make that decision? So what happens is, um, uh, well, so, um, and I would think the occupiers have led on this pretty, pretty <laughs> clearly is, um, so first, if somebody comes with a technology solution, it's got to get through compliance. So we have certifications and requirements like most of you do. Which is a uh, very fun process for us, yeah, by the way. Right. So awesome. if you're a technology provider or you know, a, a startup or you have an idea around technology, if you can't get through that compliance, it will never hit the light of day. So once you've said, hey, I'm, I'm secure, I'm safe, I'm sustainable, I'm scalable, all that stuff, then um, it starts to get through to the business, and then the business has to own it, and then it goes through kind of priorities to, to understand the impact on all the different services and things we do. Um, and we pick, you know, very carefully what we think is gonna have the um, most benefit to the business. I wouldn't say that we are deploying stuff that we think will work, 
uh, we might um, have a pilot around that. But, um, and part of that business case would involve some people who would actually use it, and they're part of that beta test, but we're, we're pretty careful about how we adopt that stuff. And candidly, we might lose some first mover advantage as a result, but, but we can't jeopardize some of the uh, integrity of the systems around some really kind of forward thinking stuff. Greg, did you want to? It's one, you know, with, with us, it's like one of those science fiction movies where nobody's over 30. Um, so I, for us, uh, we think it's so important that it doesn't start here. I meet with three or four technology companies every week. And I don't, I, it may not even have an application, but I'm always curious. And, and we always have people who actually speak the language. So if I'm meeting with somebody, there's somebody who's under 30 sitting next to me, um, translating <laughs> into my language. So what did he say? Um, and, and, that's, and that's critical. So we, we, we established a group of young people who are our tech, our tech Tech people, that's who, you know, they see it. My, my granddaughter could, will see technology better than I would. So I, I you know, so I, I know that, so I believe that the, the, you know, if you started here, you started in compliance, you're gonna miss a good idea. Because there's gonna be a great idea. And then the way I look at compliance and the way I look at our council is I say to the council, don't tell me I can't do it, tell me how I can do it. And so if I'm gonna leave anything to compliance to decide how I'm gonna make a decision around something that's brilliant, then I'm gonna probably have, well, no, I don't think you should do that. I mean, I have, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, just changing, just eliminating Grub from my name. I got a call from my attorney, we can't eliminate Grub in states where it's a DBA, blah, blah, blah. I said, just tell me how to do it. Don't tell, don't give me, save me the speech. And, that, and, that's, and that's what you'll get. You know, it's like a horse by committee. That's a camel. So, <laughs> sorry. Great, did you wanna? We have cross-disciplinary digital boards for each of our businesses. And it's an opportunity to bring together the functional leads, so clearly IT and research and innovation and lots of other areas. And then the digital natives we're bringing in, companies we're buying, their senior professionals, laterals that come in with a lot of digital experience. You put them in a room versus a, a group of older brokers and you get different outcomes because you get perspectives on the technology. We're tracking over 300 prop tech technologies right now, and we're partnering, or actually working on adoption, maybe even deployment, on a dozen to 15 at any one time. So we're constantly looking at things, and in our point solution world, we find a better solution, it's gotta be plug and play. We gotta, we gotta be able to pull it out and move on to the next thing. So all those companies still have the incentive to keep on innovating. But if you're not thinking across, really, the the digital board that you set up, however you want to talk about it, it becomes the beginning of adoption and deployment because you get some engagement from the businesses and then a really broad perspective. So something we all have to learn at the next level is we become real estate technology companies as opposed to the old real estate companies we were. Well, thanks, guys. Listen, obviously, we, we talked about a lot today. and I think given the discussion yesterday, there was a lot of talk about, you know, how do I get my brokers to, to use to, or leverage technology better? Uh, what does brokerage look like over the next couple of years? I think you guys did a great job of, of answering those questions. I think that you know, there's a common thread in that there is a lot of change coming. You guys are very focused on technology, and I think that the refreshing message for you guys in the room is that um, adoption is important for you guys, and I think you guys are open to new ways to help align with customers and in, in, in looking to, uh, to improve that. So thank you guys very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you.